It's a real quick moment. If you're watching with us online or if you're a guest of ours here today, uh, and we just want to still connect with you, even though it's just a little different during this time, and there's a number on the screen. If you could just text the word welcome to 720-575-5713, that's a way that we can just connect with you. We'll be able to reach out to you via text or phone or email, however you would prefer. And so we welcome and encourage everybody watching online to do that as well. Also this morning, um, we're going to show you just a, a, a graphic that if you would like one of our digital bulletins, uh, all you have to do is take your phone uh, on the camera function and just put that um, QR code uh, in your camera and then it will pop up uh, with an option to open the bulletin. And so you'll be able to follow along with Pastor Mark. We've also added this in our new church app. So if you have the church app and you open to just the welcome page, the very first page, you'll see on their virtual bulletin at the very bottom right. And so that will allow you uh, to just click on that as well and open it there. And if you don't have the app yet, we'd love for you to download the app. Just go to your app store or to the Google store and just search Mississippi Ave Baptist. And you'll see our app pop up. And you can watch sermons online. Uh, you can watch services live. You can uh, give. You can do all kinds of things on that. It's kind of the one-stop shop for the church family. So we encourage you to do that. But we are excited to be here today and to worship. I just want to encourage you. Let's open with a word of prayer this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are just thankful uh, for the blessings that you have given us. We are grateful for your mercy that sustains us and your grace that saves us. And Father, as we come this morning, we just pray that you would be with Mike and the worship team as they lead us in song. We pray that you would help our hearts and minds to be open uh, to the word that Pastor Mark is going to bring from you today through your holy word. And Lord, we just want to be uh, faithful servants uh, that are serving you. Lord, we love you, and we thank you, and we give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And when we go ahead and stand, we'll praise God this morning. Praise the Lord, His mercy. Praise the Lord, His mercy. 
mercies more Stronger than darkness New every more Our sins they are many His mercies more Our sins they are many His mercies more It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, when to know the safe my Jesus, I love thee, not know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin, I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my sweet to trust in Jesus. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to trust His cleansing blood. Just in simple faith to punch me. Beneath the healing cleansing flood. so glad I learned to trust. I'm so glad I learned to trust Thee. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend, when I know that Thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for the grace to trust Him more. Oh, for grace to trust Him more. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth. 
earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, in darkness tries to hide, trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. And how great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. H2H, when H2H he stands. And time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead, three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, Lion and the Lamb, Lion and the Lamb, how great. Above all. filled with the word. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. Let it permeate your life. And it says that the response of someone whose life is permeated by the word of God is going to be to worship. And then it also says, let us make songs and, and melodies and sing songs in our hearts to God, but also with one another. So as we call this, this out here and we say, sing with me. How great is our God. Just lift this song up together. Lift our voices up together this morning. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God, how great. this morning that you are great, you are awesome, you're the matchless one. We don't have enough words in our English language to describe. We could stand here all day and try to, and we would fail to describe how awesome and how great you are. You alone are worthy of our worship, worthy of our praise. So help us this morning as we worship you, that we worship you in spirit and in truth. As we hear your word read, taught this morning, that we would be open and ready and willing to receive what you have for us. You teach us this morning, God, and we pray for Pastor Mark that as he comes to preach, that we know it's not about the man who stands up here, it's not about any individual that sings up here, but this celebration this morning is all about you. So we look toward you for our, to be content. We look to you for our joy, for our hope, everlasting. And that's all in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, uh, 
I'm Ian, this is my wife Haley. Yeah, we um, are uh, going to South Asia um, and going there to, to take the gospel to a mega city in South Asia. Uh, we've been from Colorado, we've been um, involved in ministry for the past uh, about 12 years now. Um, and going, we've been to this, this city in South Asia before. We've also been a part of mobilizing and sending people for the past uh, five or six years. Yeah, so the, the city we're going to um, in South Asia is a city of 20 million people. Um, the local believing population there is 0.02%, uh, so it's a very, very lost place. Um, so we're going there basically to take the gospel there um, and, and to plant churches. And we want to see um, those churches be indigenous, be like the culture, and have a passion for uh, wanting to plant other churches. We uh, lived in South Asia from 2011 to 2014 before we had kids. Um, yeah, and while we were there, we felt like this is what God was calling us to for a lifetime, um, specifically reaching Muslims with the gospel. Um, so now we're going back with kids that are ages five, four, and three. So it's a different uh, ball game altogether, but um, we're excited. We just want people to know that we really need people uh, to partner with us. Um, in this work um, in, in multiple ways. So one of the biggest, most important ways is through prayer. Um, we just know the place we're going to, it's just um, so dark and so oppressive um, that really if, if anything is going to happen, it's going to be the Lord's doing and it's going to be uh, God's people um, praying for us. And so we would ask that, you know, the, the church back here would, would partner with us primarily in prayer um, and, and, and encouragement. We're, we're uh, people that need a lot of uh, encouragement and, and spurring on and so um, that's kind of the big thing and, and we're excited for you guys to be a part of that yeah i mean one in four lost people live in south asia there's more muslims in south asia than all of the middle east combined and so um yeah would you just intercede for these people and would you come would you come join us we'd love for you to come on a short-term trip long-term trip we want um, our partnership with uh, mississippi avenue baptist church to really be um something where you, you get to come alongside with us um, in really tangible ways through prayer and for, through coming. So we'd love for you to come join us. Good morning, church. This is probably why we should do sound check, huh? That's my fault. Sorry, guys. Um, so you just saw a video from a couple who live here in Aurora. Uh, Ian and Haley, we can't say their last name uh, because uh, they're headed to South Asia and the country they're headed to uh, is adamantly opposed to the faith. And so just understand that one day we'll be able to put in your hand uh, prayer cards for them and for their family. We just can't do it right now. Uh, and so what we would invite everybody to do is to pray for Ian and Haley. We will be financially supporting them. They're going through a special uh, sort of program with the International Mission Board. And the, the best thing about their heart was this attitude of saying, um, they had been on staff at Calvary Wellspring uh, here in Aurora. It's uh, in the old Chambers Road uh, Baptist Church building. And they had uh, had to raise support in order to serve on that staff. And so they were raising financial support to be able to serve and to live here in the U.S. And when they felt like God was calling them to South Asia, they said, well, we'll just go back to those same people. We'll have to add a few more uh, because of distance and travel and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and instead of taking resources from the IMB and... Um, Though it might cost somebody else the opportunity to go overseas, they said, well, we'll continue just to raise our support, go with the International Mission Board, serve overseas so that another missionary family can go as well. So that was, you know, extremely uh, a blessing and impressive of them. And so our church is, in a very small way, just financially supporting them uh, month to month. And so it's based on your generosity that we're able to do so. So we want to say thank you. We'd also encourage everyone that there will be a time uh, in which we can uh, go travel there. And so, Lord willing... Uh, in the next year or year and a half, we'll be able to go take a team uh, to South Asia, to that people group, to share the gospel in uh, their mega city. As you heard, it's a, you know, what, what was a 0.2 or 0.02, you know, percent Christian, which is, you know, a significant uh, problem. And so what we need to be doing is praying for, the, for uh, Ian and Haley and their family, praying for their ministry, praying for those people uh, to come to faith. And we'll be able to pass out prayer cards at some point, and you'll know more about where they are. Uh, that we can't share because we're, you know, we're online and it could get around the world really quickly. So let's take a moment and just pray for this family 
Uh, you heard them, their three kids, uh, two that they adopted through the foster care program uh, here in Colorado. And so we're going to pray for God just to use them and bless their ministry. So if you would bow your heads with me, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for Ian and Haley. Lord, we're so grateful uh, that you have placed on their heart uh, a passion and desire to go uh, into a city where very, very few people have heard the gospel and even fewer believe. And so, Lord, we just ask for you to bless and anoint their ministry, Lord. I'm so grateful that, that they're just uh, a normal com- uh, couple, a normal family uh, with an awesome God and incredible obedience. And so, Lord, we just ask for you to give us all that same burden for our friends, for our family, for our community that you've given to Ian and Haley uh, for that city, for that people. And so, Lord, as they go back uh, and they continue to learn the language, as they continue to learn the culture, as they continue to minister, Lord, we just pray that you'll pour out your blessings upon them. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to continue in 1 John, so let me invite you to open your Bibles uh, to 1 John uh, chapter 2. It's possible uh, that we're only going to get through one point today. So the best part about a Saturday afternoon service and having a wife that attends a Saturday afternoon service, she says, yeah, that first point was really good, but I'm not quite sure what you were trying to do on point two. So we're just, maybe we'll just sit uh, on point one, and I'll do a better job on point two uh, next week. So 1 John 2, we're going to read what, everything we were planning on reading anyway, uh, but we're going to just start in 1 John 2, verse 28. So open your Bibles, your Bible apps. Again, if you have the church app, which I would recommend you do, uh, so long as you have a phone that was built in the century, Wayne, uh, you can just open that up, download that app, uh, and even follow along on our virtual bulletin there. Wayne just loves it when we make fun of him for uh, his uh, flip phone from 1995. So uh, love him <laughs> and love his attitude. He, he's really good-natured about it. Uh, what we're going to see today is uh, that really, you know, there's a bit of an issue of understanding sometimes really what is the reward of our faith. Now here's just an example I'm going to give to you. So I uh, had the opportunity uh, to teach Uh, online for Midwestern Seminary. It's one of our uh, Southern Baptist seminaries, and so I get to teach for them uh, every so often, and it's real clear. So right now, I have 25 students, uh, and it's very, very clear which students are in the program to learn and which students are in the program to get a degree. Teachers, you know what I'm talking about? That there are just some students that they just believe D is for diploma, uh, and so they give minimal effort uh, and all they're in it is just to get that, uh, you know, Masters of Divinity so they can put it on a resume and so that one day a church might hire them, right? But there are other students who are in school in order to learn. And surprisingly, that's why we should go to school. It's not to earn a degree. Uh, we should go to school, whether it is high school, all the way up to whatever you pursue. Uh, we should go in order to learn, right? I mean, I want the teachers in here to give a hearty amen to that, Okay. So we go to school in order to learn, and the reward of going to school is not the diploma, as beautiful as they are on our walls, it's not the diploma as nice as they are on our resume, we should go to school in order to learn. The reward is the learning. Same thing, right, if you have kids or grandkids or greats or whatever, and they come to your house, and they see that your uh, cereal has a toy in it, right, and they think that the prize or the reward of the cereal is the toy, and it's not. Even as sugary as that cereal might be, the reward of the cereal is the food. The reward of a happy meal is the food, right? It's not the prize. It is the supposed nutrition, right, that is in a happy meal. Although, we, you know, it's kind of dubious how much nutrition uh, is in a happy meal or how much nutrition is in, uh, you know, the, the sugary cereal that we've got. But the real reward of a happy meal is the food. The real reward of cereal is the cereal. The real reward of learning, of school, excuse me, is learning. And the real reward of our faith is not heaven. The reward of our faith is Jesus. Now, it's really cool whenever you have a happy meal, or it was, I guess, at the time, to get a prize, right? Chick-fil-A gives you a book in which you promptly send your child up to get some ice cream. The real reward of school is not the diploma. It's nice to get a diploma, right? And you certainly, if you pour in, and I'm sure there's some people out here saying, yes, but my kid went to school for four years and didn't get a diploma. And you say, yeah, okay, I hear you, 
right? The diploma is good. The diploma is important. Heaven is good. Heaven is important. But the real reward of our faith is Jesus. And I think this is a correction of us. That we don't entirely understand that. We don't always understand that in our gospel presentations. We don't always get it right whenever we think about our faith. We don't always get it right. And so what we need to do is we need to hear from John today who's going to tell us that one of the most important things that we can do as a believer is to abide in Christ. And what that reminds us is that the real reward of our faith is Jesus. Let's look at what he says here in 1 John 2. Starting in verse 28. We are going to go ahead and read 3-3, uh, three, three, but I don't know that we're going to explain 1-3-3. Three, three. I'll come back to that next week, it says. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Now see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But, what we know, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your word, so grateful for the truth of your word, and we just ask for your help this morning. We ask for your help to understand this word, understand and apply it. We pray that we see that the real reward of all this that we do is to have a deeper and wider relationship with you. So Father, we're so thankful that you showed your love for us. You sent your son to this earth. He made things right that we might have a relationship with you for all of eternity. And I pray, Father, for your help to get these things right, that we live for you because we understand that you are the reward. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Now, the last few weeks, we've been in John, 1 John chapter 2. And last week especially, we looked at something. There were two sort of things going on uh, in the paragraph right above this one, or the two paragraphs right above this one. And the first part was that, that we just got really excited, right? We read about it and we think, okay, uh, we're Baptists and we love talking about the end times, right? And especially we look around and we say, there's no way, right? You see what's happening uh, with COVID. You see what's happening uh, in, you know, I don't know, Portland. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, if you think of heaven as a wonderful place, you think Portland as a, I just don't know what that place is, right? So, um, we get excited because John brings up the Antichrist. We think, this is great. He's going to start talking about the end times, and he actually doesn't. He says, we know that the Antichrist is coming, but Antichrists are here today. And so we might wonder, okay, what in the world is he talking about? Because there's only room in my Tim LaHaye uh, end times theology for one Antichrist. So what's going on here? And we see that he's talking about people who literally were Antichrist, meaning they were against Jesus. They were against Jesus as the Christ. And he gave us two things, two pieces of evidence to understand who these people were. And we understood first that they went out from us, but they were not of us. So verse 19, so First uh, John 2, 19 says, they went out from us because they were not actually of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. And we just saw sort of that, you know, there's a little bit of a falsehood in American Christianity or in American culture. And that idea is that it's possible to have churchless Christianity. That church is only an option. And here's the deal with quarantine and COVID and all that sort of stuff. That idea is only going to get stronger. And so I'm really, I'm talking to the folks who are following online. That there's going to be a temptation, thanks to the beautiful inventions of, the, of this century, of the internet and of streaming and of all those amazing things, to then start thinking that the church, or being here in the gathered church, is merely optional. All right, but there would be no sense of churchless Christianity for that first century church. In fact, what John has to say is, okay, if you claim to be a Christian and then you reject the church and you're no longer a part of the church, right? And they wouldn't have Easter Sunday and Christmas Sunday and, I don't know, Mother's Day in which there was pressure to show up, right? But essentially, if you're living a 49 or a 50 or a 52 Sunday a year churchless Christianity, 
what the folks in the first century would turn to you and say, well, then you're not practicing Christianity. There's no such thing as churchless Christianity. Now, we get it for those people who might be shut in and want to be here but can't, or because of quarantine, want to be here but can't. But understand that once this thing is over, that for the vast majority of people, we have to... We have to understand that to be a Christian is to be involved in church. Now, some people might be engaging online and saying, well, you're just saying that because your salary is dependent upon how many people show up to church. And I'm just going to say, hey, if you think, if you have a problem with that, just give it a try for a little while. Don't, you know, come, don't give, and you're going to taste and see that the Lord is good, and then you're going to want to be obedient in your gifts, okay? So I'm not just saying this because it's dependent upon our, our, our tithe or anything like that. Listen. It's so important for us to understand that the church is essential to Christianity, right? We can't go through all this in which people tell us church is not essential and then have that same attitude, right? Church is essential to our faith. And we get it, I get it, you know, don't come back until you feel safe, but there's going to come a point in which there's no excuse not to come back. And at that point, understand, you can't just practice virtual Christianity. And there's no such thing in the Bible as churchless Christianity. That was the first evidence of who these people were as false teachers, right? And I know that this is a hard truth because we're all thinking of a family member who practices churchless Christianity, right? And we're not, we're going to evaluate them. You can evaluate them on a one-on-one basis, but just friends, just understand there's no thing in here, there's no approach to that that's a falsehood of our culture, okay? The second way that we understood them to be antichrist is what they said about Jesus. Here's what it says in verse 22. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. And what he's really talking about there, because we understand this as it sort of developed in history, that there was a group of people who said that Jesus was not in fact divine, that he was born 100% person, 0% divine, and then at some point, God came into him, giving him that divinity that he expressed for a temporary amount of time, and at the cross, God left him, right? And so you see that these false teachers, what they did is they manipulated Scripture in order to fit what they wanted to believe, and that's still prominent to today, right? So we have to identify false teachers because false teachers sound oftentimes the best false teachers. I know that's weird to say, but the best false teachers take Scripture and they start to manipulate it. And that's what this group of people was doing. These antichrists, these false teachers, invaded and they started to manipulate Scripture into what they wanted to believe. That happens today. People manipulate Scripture in order to meet what they want. It happens in our culture. We have to watch out for it. Right? And so they're going to come to us and we're going to say certain things are right and certain things are wrong. Not based on our opinion. Okay? Not based on our opinion, but based on the truth that God has given to us. In his word. And what we're going to say is, as nice as it is, right, that you can just feel like you can go to, you know, you can go to McDonald's and you can tell them, hold the pickle, hold the onions, you know, add some extra mustard on there, and McDonald's will sometimes get it right. Right? That's why you go to Chick-fil-A, because they're always going to get it right. Right? Amen? Right? They're not going to screw that up. And so people approach the Bible in the same way. And they say, okay, I understand that the Bible says this, but I'm not, you know, I don't think that that's true, and it just don't disagree with me, because if you disagree with me, you're judging me, and the Bible says do not judge, right? And you just say, gosh, that's really silly. The only reason why we're pointing this out is not so that you don't have to worry about me judging you, right? In fact, you should be an emotionally mature enough person not to really worry about me judging you, but what you have to realize is when the Bible says something wrong, and the church then says something's wrong, and a pastor says something's wrong, Based on what the Bible says is we're not judging you, we're just telling you, God already is judging you. And so we're just, we've got your back. We're just trying to do you a favor, right? So we cannot manipulate Scripture according to what we want it to say. The second thing, or third thing, I don't know, where am I at? Whatever, the next thing is that people try to manipulate Scripture according to desires, right? And we see this, the most prevalent, the most obvious one today is in the health and wealth church. And so they just so happen to live among a people that really like to be healthy and really like to be wealthy, right? So Western, you know, Western Christians, American Christians, really like the idea that God wants me to be healthy and God wants me to be wealthy. And so they bend Scripture to say, oh, this faith is all about you. It's all about your happiness. It's all about your 
health. It's all about your wealth. And so you name it and you claim it and all that other sort of garbage. What you realize is that those are false teachers, people who are against Christ, who are manipulating Scripture according to their desires. And then, both from the right and from the left, we're entering into a time in which people are going to try and manipulate Scripture, oftentimes based on our fears, in order to see their candidate elected. Okay, so we have to be aware of it. We can hold our convictions, right, about the future of our country without having to manipulate Scripture in that way. And so, friends, as people say, whether, you know, they think the future of Christianity is at risk, you know, on November 3rd or not, is silly. The church is in Jesus' hands. The mission of Jesus is, is in the hands of obedient Christians. So we have to, no matter what happens, November 3rd, right? I I just wish that we could travel out of the country that day. I just wish, let me just take a week off, right? Let me just head out, let me vote and then leave, right? But that just is what it is, because things are going to be nuts no matter what happens. But friends, the future of Christianity is not at risk. Not in this country. Jesus said he'll build his church. And then Jesus has gone to his people and said, obey, and people come to faith. The fields are white for the harvest on November 4th, no matter who wins on November 3rd, okay? And so the future of Christianity in this country, it's in Jesus's hands, and he's entrusted it to the obedience of his people, okay? So false teachers, we have to watch out for them, and sort of the inoculation against them is is whether or not we are obedient Right, because we've been anointed, the Holy Spirit has been given us, the truth has been given us, and so we need to live out that truth, right? So in his word and in his spirit, we have to live out his word, which brings us to the end of last week's passage. And it said, just as it has been taught to you, abide in him. So abide in Jesus. And he goes on to say, now little children, abide in him. So he says it again. When, when, and when, when the scripture repeats itself, understand that the Holy Spirit is speaking to the writer and really emphasizing something. And so it says to us twice, abide in him. So we're to abide in Jesus. Now we're going to talk about in just a couple of moments, what does that actually mean? But first we're going to look at what is the benefit of abiding in Jesus. And it says, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. So here's what has happened, right? So if you think about Adam and Eve, right? You think about Adam and Eve, and before the fall, before they sinned, they had confidence Right? Not pride, but confidence at the Lord's coming. So we're told that when God created Adam and Eve and he put them in the garden and then he would walk with them in the cool of the day. And so God would show up and Adam and Eve would walk with God in his presence, right? Uh, just fully comfortable in who he was and who they were. And so they had what we'll call positional confidence in God, right? With God. So he's present They're not scared. They have right relationship with him. They're hanging out with him. He's hanging out with them. I don't know what they're doing. We're not told, but it says that they're walking together, right? Maybe they're just enjoying the garden. Then the fall happens, and Adam and Eve believe a lie. They eat the fruit, and God shows up. And when God shows up that very next day, right after the fall, what happens? Adam and Eve hide. They, to borrow a phrase from John, they shrink back, right? What John says to them, that they shrink from him in shame at his coming. So we have, the, again, this picture John is using often of what's happening just in, in you know, Genesis 3 is exactly what's going to happen with us, right? So there are going to be people who, at God's coming, when he shows up again, when Jesus comes back a second time, they're going to shrink back at his coming just like Adam and Eve did when God showed up too. Are you following me? You're tracking along there? Now here's the thing. Here's what God has done is he's reversed it, right? So Adam and Eve were fine. God shows up. They shrink back. Jesus shows up, right? Jesus shows up the first time. He makes things right so that when he comes back, we don't shrink back, okay? So just like when God was there in the garden, that we had, Adam and Eve had com- perfect, complete, positional confidence that when God showed up, that they were not in fear, 
right? So that now when Jesus shows up, he has a group of people around the world, and we hope more in South Asia as we send people there, and more here in Aurora as we go out, that we'll have positional confidence at God's return. So he shows up. We're not in fear. We're excited to see him, and we're ready to spend eternity with him because Jesus is the reward, right? Okay. So what God has done is he's reversed the effects of the fall. We get to live with him in the same way that Adam and Eve lived with him before they sinned. So we have positional confidence. And here's, let me just paint this picture. I hope, I hope this picture makes sense. So we can have confidence in him uh, in, this, in a little bit of the same way. That, so let's just say uh, that John Elway was to come to church this morning. Right? I think we'd all be excited because we think John Elway needs a little bit of Jesus, right? So John Elway shows up, and he walks up, and he, he just sort of interrupts the service. Uh, and, and I don't know, he's John Elway. We might give him that grace, right? So Dale, don't shoot him. Um, he walks up, and he says, you know, hey, Mark, um, you know, we have Drew Locke. He's our starting quarterback, but we really don't have a backup. And I would say, yeah, you really don't have a backup, buddy. You really need to get one uh, before maybe they play football in a few weeks. And he says, well, Mark, I want you to try out. And all of a sudden, I go from excited to see John Elway to I'm shrinking back from him just a little bit, right? Right? It, it's John Elway, so I'm a little bit scared, right? And he says, okay, I need you to run a 40, right? And then they don't have a timer. They don't have a clock that, that counts that high, right? You got me. A 40 is when you run 40 yards, and they, they hit the button, and there's just not a clock that goes high enough for me to run, or they, 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 they you know, pull out uh, a 12, you know, <laughs> that's, I mean, they, they tell me to do a broad jump, uh, and they don't have a ruler small enough for it, right? Or they tell me to, uh, to do a long jump, and they're, they're, they tell me to jump, and I jump, and they say, well, we're ready for you to jump, and I haven't, you know, I did, right? So, right, or he says, okay, go throw the football, right? And he just sees that my spin is not quite as tight as it needs to be. The distance is not quite as far. The accuracy is not quite as good. And I go to him, and I say, well, just like your backup. No, I'm just kidding. So I just say, yes, you're right, right? I would shrink back in fear. Then if they put me in pads, and I go up against the first team defense, and all of a sudden, I have Vaughn Miller coming off of one side and Bradley Chubb coming off the other, and I'm just handing them the football, right? Just like, um, just like Cam did in the Super Bowl. No, I'm just doing that for Bryce. So uh, I'm scared, right, whenever Vaughn Miller's coming off, and I'm shrinking back, and I'm just running the opposite direction, and I still can't outrun them, right? And they get me, and I'm dead, right? So I'm going to shrink back in fear in that. But guess what? What if, what if John Elway was my dad? And John Elway comes up to me and says, hey, let's play catch. At that point, I'm not worried about how slow I run, how far I jump, how tight the spiral is, how accurate my throw is. I don't have to worry. He's my dad. That's what's happened for us in Christ. Right? We go from being no relationship with God no positional confidence with God, to then he brings us into his family, and I have complete positional confidence with God. That when he shows up, I don't shrink back in fear. Absolutely confident in our relationship. Right? For us to get from where we are, or where we used to be, right? So all of us, there was a time in our life in which we were not in right relationship with God. For some of us, it was when we were a kid, right? So there was a few years when we were a kid that we were not in right relationship with God. For some folks who are either here in person or following along online, or you might be thinking of somebody in your life, that if God shows up, they will shrink back in fear because they're not in right relationship with Him. But for the rest of us, right, those of us who abide in Christ, and I'm going to define that in one second, using John 15. So if you want to start you know, turning in your Bible, your Bible app to John 15, You'll be able to follow along that we're going to see what it means to abide in Christ. So when I abide in Christ and God shows back up, I'm in complete positional confidence because of what he has done for me and the belief I've placed in him and how I live out that faith so that Jesus shows up and I don't have to worry. I don't shrink back. I'm not scared. Okay? Because my dad is God the Father and I'm in right, perfect relationship with him. Okay? So, for us to get there, from where we were 
It's where we are in Christ. We have to do these things. We have to abide in Christ. And John 15 is going to help us out here. John 15, 1 through 11. So I'd love it if you have a Bible to turn there. If you have a Bible app to turn there too. But if you don't, it's okay because the words will be on the screen. Here's what it has to say. It says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Right? So that means like the gardener. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. And so let's start looking for this phrase, abide, right? Abide in me. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. So we've got our first one. We've got our first abiding, right? So how do we abide in him? Right? We've gone from being dirty to clean, and we've been grafted onto the branch. So we're on the branch. Jesus is the branch. I'm sorry, we're the branch. Jesus is the vine. And so we're put onto the vine, grafted onto the vine, and we're producing fruit, and we've gone from being dirty to clean. When does that happen for us? Well, it happens at salvation. For the first thing for us to do to abide in Christ means that we have to believe. Okay? Now, there's more to it, right? That's what John has been helping us to understand. Is that, yes, there's a decision to believe in and follow Jesus, and then there's more. So the very first thing that we have to do to abide in Christ, right, so that when he returns, we're in perfect positional confidence, not scared, not shrinking back, is that we believe in Jesus. We've gone from dirty to clean, okay? All right, continue in verse 4. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So we have it keeping going, right? I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abide in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So we see that those who abide, what does it mean for us to abide in Christ? We believe and then we do what? We produce fruit, right? There is fruit of salvation, right? It's not just enough to believe, right? Because he warns us. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, right? So there is no Christianity that does not also bear fruit. And what is that fruit? It's the fruit of good works. What does good works include? Right? If we literally think of a vine that reproduces, what are we talking about? Yes, sharing the gospel. Right? So there's an expectation that the vine, his branches, reproduce. Right? So we have the fruit of good works. Right? We can go through those good works, serving others, being kind to others. But they also have to understand that there's an expectation for the branches of Christ to reproduce. And so the good works of sharing the gospel. Okay? Okay? And apart from him, we can do nothing. All right, so in the next one. If anyone who does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. Now here's the challenge. Right, so if you uh, go to the store, and if you didn't do this, fellas, the last couple of weeks at King Supers, a dozen roses have been $6. Okay, That's that's an easy win. Now, if your wife is here, just, just tell her you bought the expensive flowers. Right? But you go to the store, and you buy those $6 dozen roses. And you, I didn't tell this story last night because Janet was here. And you say, I love you, honey. You know, just saw these, and I thought of you. And actually what I did is I saw them. I saw 6 bucks, and I thought, yeah, that's easy. So I bought them, and I gave them to her, and she, you know, thank you so much, whatever. What do those roses do over the next week? They... Yes, but they mimic being alive, right? They look like they're alive. They go from closed to open, from, you know, just stale to fragrant, right? And they add beauty to the room. And here's the problem, here's the challenge, is that there are people that can mimic being Christians. For a little while, a dead branch can mimic being alive just like a dead flower can mimic being alive. 
right? So that's a little bit of a challenge for us. We're going to come back to that in a few moments, okay? So for us to abide in Christ, we have to believe, we have to reproduce, we have to make sure that we're not dead, right? That we genuinely believe, and there's a way for faith to be mimicked. So let's keep going, right? If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now this is the favorite, right, one of those favorite verses of seventh grade boys, right? Because they, they read this verse or what Jesus has to say in the Sermon on the Mount about prayer. It says, you know, ask whatever you want of the Father and he'll give it to you. And they say, this is great. I'm going to ask God for a Lamborghini. And you're like, well, good, good luck with that. Right? But here's what John is telling us. As we abide in the Lord, his word, his word abides in us. Well, how does his word abide in us? Well, we read it, we study it, and we apply it. Right? As we do those things, his word, we're told, starts to change us right? So his words start to change us, and so that our character starts to match God's character, right? I mean, it takes a long time, and it's not going to be fully realized until Jesus comes back, but our character starts to change. And so we see then that as soon as our character changes, then as we pray out of that change in character, we're going to pray for godly things, and God grants prayers for godly things. He's not going to answer our prayer uh, for a Lamborghini, right? He's just not going to do it, right? He's going to answer our prayers when they are according to his will, his word, and our character shows it, right? So we change when we abide in Christ, and our character starts to match up. So we've seen three things so far, right? We believe, that's how we abide in Christ. We produce good fruit, that's how we abide in Christ, and our character starts to match the character of a follower of Christ, right? Okay, so we have three things so far. We're going to have one more. He says, uh, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples, right? So there's, again, this is just a reaffirmation of that second one. Followers of Christ bear fruit. So what is the last one? Well, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. So there's the next one. The fourth one is really for us to understand that we have to love others, right? So we have four things. What does it mean to abide in Christ? At least as we walk through this passage, there's four things that we have to do. Believe, that the one's the most obvious. Bear fruit. Make sure that we're living a life that's not a mimic of Christ, but is genuine in faith. We prove that we're his disciples by producing fruit. Our character starts to change. And then what else? We start to love. In Matthew 22, 37 through 40, Jesus says that the greatest commandments, right, I'm just paraphrasing, are to love God and to love other people, right? So the commandments he's speaking of, for us to abide in Christ is to abide in his love. So we love God, we love others, and then John 13, 34, and 35, what does it say to us? Right, this commandment, I've been talking about this one for several weeks, so I expect you to know it. This is a commandment I give to you that you love one another. It is how the world will know that you're my disciples, by your love for one another, right? And so we see really just what does it mean for us to abide in Christ? And I just have to be frank, before this week, if you had said to me last Sunday, Mark, what does it mean to abide in Christ? I'd say, man, I'm not really quite sure. But now we can understand it in four different ways. The first one is belief. Second one is fruit. Third one is character. Last one is love. So there's at least four ways that we abide in Christ. So that at his coming... Right? At his return, what happens? We have confidence, positional confidence before God. Right? We won't shrink back in him like Adam and Eve. In fact, what Jesus has done is he's fixed that so that before Jesus, if we had no faith in Christ, Jesus comes back, then we are scared at his return. Right? The trumpet sounds. Everyone bows, everyone takes a knee, everyone confesses Jesus is Lord. Some of us get to do it as though Jesus is our Savior, and the Lord is our Father. And we say, I'm completely excited to see you, but there's going to be billions who shrink back from him as his coming and say that he is the Lord out of fear. 
What should that do for us? Well, we need to understand, right, that there's four things that we should be doing. Starts with faith. Continues in our life and good work. So let me just ask, are you doing those things? Right, again, we talk about not perfectly, but faithfully. Right, are you growing in good works? Are you more burdened today for lost people than you were six months ago? Are you more eager to tell people about Jesus than you were before? We talk about character. Is your life different because of Jesus? Are you growing? There never comes a point, there's no retirement of godliness. We don't ever say that I've arrived at character, right? It's always something that in us should be changing, and the same thing is true for love. Are you growing in your love for God and growing in your love for others, right? Not perfectly, but faithfully, right? Your trajectory might be more of a roller coaster, but at least maybe it's going up, right? That's the command that we have today. Abide in Christ. Jesus defines what that is. Belief fruit, character, and love. And here in a moment, as Mike leads in song, and as the worship team leads us, I'm so grateful for them. We just need to take a moment, a prayer of confession. God, show me where is it that I'm not abiding in you? Right? Am I telling other people about Jesus? Am I growing in my character? Am I growing in love? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we need your help. We really need to apply the truth of your word. So Jesus, we're so thankful that you define this command for us. And I pray, Father, for all of us, Lord, we're not perfect. We're not a perfect people. But I just ask for your help that we will grow in good works, that we will grow in evangelism, that we will grow in character, and that we will grow in love. And Holy Spirit, remind us of where we need the work done. And Lord, I just pray that we will all with one voice, pray a prayer of confession. We need your help. But I pray, Father, also for those who are uh, either here in person or online and who just like a flower cut off and just pretends to be alive, that there are people who are pretending to be Christians. Speak to them today. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Before we're done, I just want to take a second and just describe what that means, right, for us to, to be people of unbelief, right? So this is somebody who is a branch, but has been cut off from Jesus, right? And so this is someone who maybe looks like the other branches, right? You look like other people, you right? You look like a Christian, or you claim to be a Christian, but there are some things, you know, just quite frankly, that are missing. And so there are people who claim the name of Christ, and then you ask them, okay, this is, you're a Christian, that's great. Well, how do you Uh, go from death to life? How do you turn away from your sin? How do you have a relationship with God? And their answer is going to be, well, you see, you do that by good works. And all of a sudden you realize, oh, this person is wearing Christian clothing. But they're still dead. This is somebody who looks like a Christian, claims the name of Christ. But when Jesus comes back, it's going to wreck them. Because they're going to shrink away in fear. Because they don't actually have a relationship with Jesus. You see, we are not saved through good works. I can't tell you, gosh, I can't tell you the number of people, right? The number of faithful people, even faithful in church, who say, yeah, I'm a Christian because I'm a good person. You just, it just breaks your heart. You say, no, that is not how you become a Christian. That's not how you you have a right relationship with the Father. You're still in your unbelief. You're a rose that's been planted in water and is going to die as opposed to a rose that's still grafted to the the bush in his life. So we have to understand clearly, we do not not, uh, receive salvation because of our good works. That when we die, it's not about whether or not we've been a good person. It's about what we believe and how we live for Jesus. Okay? So you just have to watch out for that. And you're going to come across that. You're going to come across people who claim the name of Christ but think salvation is through good works. And we just have to warn those friends, those family, those loved ones. The second thing is those people who have made a decision for Jesus 
but don't abide in him. I think we can all think of somebody, probably somebody we love, who has made a decision for Jesus but does not abide in him. Right? And what does Jesus have to say about those who say that they're a Christian but there's no fruit in their life? He cuts them off. What about once saved, always saved? Well, once saved, always saved, so long as we're genuinely saved. And a genuinely saved person produces fruit. That's what Jesus says in John 15. So friends, I just want us to be aware of those friends and those family in our life. You might say, gosh, I'm not even sure who I have in my life to share the gospel with. After all, I'm not really coming into contact with the same number of people, you know, as I was, you know, pre-COVID and all that sort of stuff. I get it, but you have family. I guarantee you, we all have family, that person that you just want to say, oh, I I think they're saved. Why do you think they're saved? Well, they made a decision. Oh, I hear you. Are they bearing fruit? Are they abiding in Christ? Ask the Lord for clarity about that person. Ask God's word to give you clarity about that person. And then don't give up on them. It's never too late to be grafted in and to be a part of the vine. So friends, I'm just going to ask you, if that's you online, if you said, gosh, yeah, I've made a decision, but I've not abided in him, or... I claim to be a Christian, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm good because of my good works. I'm just here to say that's not true. What you have to do is you have to understand that you are a sinner and your sin separates you from God. You have to believe that Jesus died and rose again. And even there's going to be some people in our life that are going to believe this up through that point. Say, yeah, I get it. I'm a sinner. Jesus died. Jesus rose again. And then what? You commit your life to follow him. And they're not ready to make that next step. And so, friends, here's what we're going to do. Is if you're ready to go from... I've claimed Christian, but I think it's based on my good works, or I've made a decision, but I'm not abiding in him. I'm not living for him. Make that commitment today. If you're here in the room and you want to do that, you've never done that in your life, let me just invite for you to talk to one of our pastors. Talk to one of us. Before you walk out those doors, talk to one of us. Before you leave this facility, talk to one of us. But if you're online, what I would encourage you to do is to text faith to 720-575-5713, and one of the pastors will give you a call. We also understand that there's a lot going on in the world today. There are people with, you know, just because, you know, we've got this global pandemic and we've got some social unrest, we also know that there's stuff going on in your life, right? We have people who, uh, who are getting biopsies. We, get, we have people who are uh, experiencing joblessness. We have people who, you know, all sorts of stuff. And what we want to do is we want to, as your pastors, is we want to pray for you. It's a privilege to pray for you. So we would invite for you to do to tell us your prayer request or to text prayer to 720-575-5713 and a pastor will be in contact with you to say, how can we pray for you? But friends, as we move into a time of reflection, what I want us to do is for, I want all of us to stand. Just right at the second, everyone to stand. Mike is going to lead in song. What I would encourage you to do is before you sing, ask the Lord, Where is it that I am not abiding in Christ? Help me. Or where is it that I'm not just pursuing? Help me. Before you sing one word. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more.
Have a seat for a few moments, and we get a few announcements for you. Hey, good morning, church family. We're broadcasting to you live today from the He-Man MABC Golf Tournament this past Thursday at Green Valley Ranch. What a great day. And I'm here for another exciting event to remind you about tonight. We have a business meeting at 5 o'clock in the Worship Center. Uh, I know you're all so excited. Pastor Mark lit something on fire last week. Come see us tonight at 5 o'clock or watch us on Zoom if you would rather stay home and be safe. But we do hope to see you tonight. We've got some exciting stuff to talk about. Hope to see you there. Hey, church family, as Pastor Bryce said, we're here at the golf tournament this past Thursday. We'll have some good news for you. We're going to have a video that gives you all the information about the golf tournament, shows you how goofy we all swing. But in order to see that, you've got to download the app, the one that we introduced last week. We told you we joined the 21st century. Go to the iTunes store, go to the Google Play store. And the only thing that's special is you have to search Mississippi Ave Baptist. I know it's a little bit unique, but that's what they chose to do. So in order to find the app, Go search Mississippi Ave Baptist. Download that today. Go watch the video of our golf tournament. Hey guys, we had a great golf tournament. Thank you for everyone who came out uh, to support MABC Student Ministry, He-Man International. So it's so good to see Todd. Todd and his family uh, have moved uh, to Arizona. So Todd, yeah, that's right. Tell us more about that, how we can pray for you, what we can do for you, buddy. Uh, well, you can start by praying that the 117 turns into 97. We'll be happy with 97 degrees. That's right. So, but it's, no, really, seriously. It was awesome, great to be back um, with MABC family and the students, and what a great tournament we had to turn That's out. Right. The weather was perfect. perfect. And I've had a chill bumps ever since I got back in Colorado, I don't understand. But anyway, it's awesome, thanks, Mark. Yeah, buddy. Great. Good to and see you. you. And you can just, just pray for Pat. That's right. You know, as she endures a new team of people and new region and a whole new life over in Arizona. That's great. So, so well, we love you, love He-Man, love everything you stand for in the ministry that you do around the world. So we'll miss you. Church family, we'll miss you the rest of this week. See you next weekend. All right, we'll go ahead and stand up and we'll sing our way out this morning. How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Bless you, church. We'll see you next weekend.
Do you, oh, do you yeah. mean do you mean like the room? You mean the the yeah. the room? Yes. Um. Well, at the moment, I have one room and then. Oh, okay. You have two rooms. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because this this doesn't work. <laughs> um. Is there something I need to change? 